female genital mutilation consists of partially or total removal of the female genitalia. Part of the genitalia in women are cut, removed, sutured. It usually happens in a group of girls. I can hear my sister having it done. It varies according to tribal custom. They pin down by family members that they trust, women they trust. The labia minora, the labia majora and the clitoris is totally removed. And then the residual tissue is sewn across in the midline, creating a barrier. It's left with a very small opening and sometimes not even a matchstick can get through that opening. Through which the woman is capable of passing urine and menstrual products. It's something I have to live with for the rest of my life. And hence again, why I don't want anyone else hearing another child screaming like that. Leila had FGM in Somalia as a child before moving to the UK. It wasn't until she had a baby that she found out it wasn't normal. FGM has been illegal in the UK since 1985, but no one's ever been convicted for it. Seeing this for the first time at medical lectures, I've had uh, people being sick in the audience because it was too much. In many countries in Africa, FGM is just the norm for women. In Somalia, 98% have had it. Exact figures on female genital mutilation in the UK are impossible because it's so secretive. A recent study estimated that 127,000 women who've come to live in England and Wales are living with the consequences of FGM. Another 10,000 girls are likely to have had it. Now, if a girl under 18 comes into this North London hospital or any hospital and the staff see or are told she has FGM, they have to tell police. Teachers and social workers will also have to report to police. Campaigner Leila has come to speak to staff. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi Amina. Nice to meet you. Hi, Gail. Nice, nice, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Gail and Amina run a specialist FGM clinic here. If another member of staff sees FGM, they'll tell these specialists. How many women are you seeing? Um, at the moment, we're seeing uh, 40 a week. Wow. But that is growing. Yeah. Oh, I, I, especially with the current awareness. 40 this, women a week. More women are going to come yeah. to the clinics. How do you guys feel about the fact that now, rather than contacting social services if you see a child with FGM, you're going to be calling the police? I've been saying to health professionals, you shouldn't feel anxious about reporting because it actually supports you. Um, it is something that you should be doing already mm -hmm. if you discover a girl who's under 18 who's had FGM. This is a medical environment, yeah. your medical staff, you're trusted, there's confidentiality, people yeah. trust you. Yeah. Do you worry about people seeing you as an arm of the police? No. If you're under 18, you're a child. So it needs to be reported anyway. But actually, we're here to support the women, to be an advocate for the women. The thing which worries me is that, for the first time, we're really cutting right across the principle of confidentiality for patients who attend their doctor junior and even senior doctors are deficient in their knowledge of genital mutilation. So without extensive re-education, I don't think this is really going to be a starter. Do you think your attitude is slightly defeatist? No, I think it's realistic. Why do you think some healthcare professionals, experts in FGM, I think mandatory reporting is a bad idea. I think really it comes down to not really understanding how that process works. I mean, for me, it's just been quite simple. You would report to me if I took my daughter to the hospital and her arm or finger was cut off, you would have to report me. So why is that any different to when her genital is cut off? So I want to ask that health professional who's resistant to this, why is that any different? It's an offence in the UK for any person, whatever their nationality, to perform FGM here, assist a girl to perform FGM here, and to assist FGM on a UK resident here or abroad. 
It's also an offence for a UK national or resident to perform FGM abroad or a sister girl to perform FGM abroad. It's now also an offence to fail to protect girls at risk of FGM, which carries a maximum sentence of seven years in prison. This applies to parents and guardians of a girl. If this works, how will you feel if and when you see the first parent go to prison for this? I would personally would like to see cutters go to prison. I mean, really, if I had to be very honest, um, because for cutters, they know the implications that, uh, that, that they're causing on these girls. And I think by having a cutter being put away, it will send a big message to the practicing community, but to also cutters out there. And if you see a parent go to prison? If I go to, would I, how would I feel? I would be very sad about it because, especially if it was a mother, because I know the mother's also a victim of this, it would be sad. But unfortunately, that's how the, if the, unfortunately we have to protect that child, the child always has to come first in this situation. The hope for those that back this rule change is that it helps in prevention, sending out an even stronger message that FGM is not acceptable. Most of all, these specialists say they want people to stop hiding the problem so women can get help and stop further generations cutting at all. The sad thing is that there are probably people out there who, children out there who have suffered harm that we're not going to know about um, unless they have complications. So, you know, and there may be children out there suffering from those complications and the parents are afraid to come forward because of the possibility of being convicted and that's even sadder. Yeah. So to those mothers I say, it's your duty to protect your child through everything and you don't want to see your child going through pain. Be brave, come forward. Even if you might be convicted? Yes. If, if if you're, that's a hard sell, isn't it? It is a hard sell. It's a, that's a, a hard, hard sell. sell.